Hi everyone and welcome to this edition of Talking Talent, focusing on how you can find a job during this time of COVID-19. I'm your host for this webinar, my name is Chido and I'm a talent partner at Accelerate. So I'm sure you're wondering what is Talking Talent? Well, this is an event we have where we invite different speakers to come on stage and talk about the future of work. This time though, we want to focus on all of you, the job seekers, the candidates that are looking for jobs. We wanna help you find a more strategic way of finding a job during this time. <clears throat> So I'm sure you're also wondering, what is Accelerate? So Accelerate is a recruitment startup. We all work with various tech startups based here in Berlin and in London, and we help them find great talent. So we were thinking, hey, why not share some knowledge and help you find your job in some of these tech startups, right? You can also check our Accelerate Jobs page and see which companies are still looking for talent. If you see anything that is in line with what you are looking for, you can also sign up for our talent community where we can keep track of your application and what you're looking for. So I would like to take this time to introduce our speakers for this evening. We have Annie Lee, Rob, and Angela, as well as your host, myself, <laughs> and we're here to give you some insight on what we know from our company clients on what they're looking for. So in this webinar, we're going to focus on key topics that will help you kickstart your job search strategy in a more strategic way. We'll focus on how to plan your job search, how to make your application stand out, how to be successful in the remote interview process, how to accept a job offer remotely, and how to onboard remotely, right? Okay, so before, um, so instead of wasting any more time, I'm going to focus on bringing Annie Lee on stage. She's going to kickstart our webinar with how to plan your job search. So Annie Lee, please come on stage. <laughs> Thank you, Cheeto, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us at this webinar. I know that right now it's a very special time. A lot of people are being impacted by what's going on in the current situation. So we want to be able to give you more actionable tips and things that you can start doing to be better at your job search. Um, so myself, um, I'm currently a recruiter working at BAC. BAC is a software that helps you organize and centralize employee requests and also automating them eventually through machine learning. So currently we're in the search for um, engineers and also marketers. Um, but throughout my career, as I've been interviewing and speaking to a lot of different candidates, I see that there are a lot of things people can improve, especially when they're trying to find a job in a startup. So the first point I want to mention is to emphasize on the word plan. I think a lot of people don't realize that when um, they're looking for a job, they need to plan for it. So if you're like me, who um, a couple of years ago were still, um, you know, finding the first LinkedIn job post saying that vaguely uh, fits to what you do, and then you hit apply, you send in that CV and you wait for for days for it to get back to you. So um, that's actually the least effective method of applying because you're not making yourself different. You're not making yourself stand out. You're not highlighting the unique value that you can potentially bring to your employer. So I want to give you three main points that would better help your uh, planning of the job search. So the first point is to really be introspective. So this is a great time to um, really understand yourself. What are your key strengths and where would you like to go? I speak to a lot of people that usually would just recite their work history as if they're a history book, um, according to the timeline, what they did at, be at the beginning, what they've been doing and what they're doing now. Um, that doesn't make much sense and it's not making you stand out. So make sure that you always prepare this personal pitch that really tells your story and really emphasizes on your key strengths. So if I were you, I would, for example, um, give like two or three of my key strengths if I were applying to a new job and really emphasize and build my work history and my experiences around those. I would say another good tip is really imagine yourself to be a salesperson for yourself and how would you solve this company's problem potentially? If you focus on that, your story and your pitch is going to be much better. So make sure this is something that you really work on before you start applying to jobs. Um, so the next 
point that I want to emphasize would be to be extrospective. Um, now is a very sensitive and special period. So um, we really have to understand the market and uh, what these industries look like right now. So I know that the coronavirus situation has impacted a lot of industries and, and potentially um, some have a harder time hiring than the others. Make sure you do the good ground research. You find out where are those companies that are still hiring um, and really inform yourself on the different roles as well. So um, I speak to a lot of people and what I see is that a lot of times people tend to say, um, okay, the industry doesn't really matter. You know, I'm open to all kinds of industries. Um, I'm happy to work on any type of product. This is not a really good answer because what the situation really shows us is that the industry that you work in really matters. Everybody has a stake in the business. What I would do is to make sure that um, I would always try to figure out as much information about my employer as possible um, and really dive deep and, and figure out um, what are they doing exactly? How do they provide their services? Um, before um, preparing for the webinar, I think we also got a question um, that Cheeto collected. Somebody was asking, how do they future-proof their career so that in the future, when something like this happens again, they can know that um, they have job security. What I would say is that you need to evaluate um, your employer just as much as they evaluate you in the interview process. Um, we cannot always predict everything, but if you can always make sure you're up to date with the current information, you understand the market, you understand where your um, company is creating value, where they're generating revenue, where they're doing business, who their customers are, you're always going to be making much more informed decision than if you were just to randomly submit applications to whoever has a job posting open. Um, the last point that I want to mention that will be really, really important is that you always have to stay in the loop. So this kind of builds on top of the other two points that we were saying earlier. Um, this is a special time that a lot of people have come together to form small groups and to really help each other out. So I know that including myself um, and the other speakers that are speaking today, they're all willing to um, help people who are struggling currently with job search. So really make sure that you find those mentors, not just on LinkedIn, but also outside potentially on Slack groups within your city or within your community, make those connections um, and really understand um, and, and get help as much as you can. Um, one of the smaller, more specific things that you can do is to search for the key term still hiring, not just on LinkedIn. Remember that you can search for jobs anywhere on the internet um, and the internet is much more than just LinkedIn. So search for still hiring and you'll be able to find a lot of information. We're also going to include a few really helpful links um, after this webinar as well. The last point is that you always need to make sure that you let people know you're open. So. Don't be afraid to include a key message um, when you're connecting with somebody on LinkedIn um, and let them know that you're open. But on the other hand, make sure you personalize it as well. So let's say if you want to reach out to a hiring manager at a marketing uh, department, maybe what you can say is, um, hi, I've created two social media posts that you can use already for your company. And I know that they can be helpful because of these reasons. Um, would you be able to consider me for your social media manager position? So make sure you're always providing a little bit of value, give a little, and then ask whether um, you can be considered for this position. So these would be the key um, points that would emphasize on planning on your job search. So um, now that you have a better idea about how to go about planning your job search, um, I want to introduce my friend Rob to talk a bit more about how to make your application stand out. Thanks, Annie, for passing on the mic. Yeah, so I just wanted to have a brief chat today about uh, how to make your application stand out. So my name is Rob. I'm a talent partner here at Accelerate. I have over three years of experience working as an IT recruiter and an additional two years working as an HR generalist. The more, majority of my time is being spent working in an agency as well as as a freelancer. I've been responsible for working on projects ranging from mid-sized startups to Fortune 500 companies. And over the last three years, I've primarily recruited with senior developers project managers, network engineers, and IT managers, and more recently, marketing leads and marketing analysts. Perfect. Okay, so the first point I wanted to make was just don't get lost in a sea of applicants. And I know that sounds it's easier said than done, but in a time like this, there will be hundreds of applicants, especially for uh, jobs with more generalized skill sets. So first off, I would only focus on applying to jobs where you meet 90 to 100 percent of the key requirements. So, for example, if you're applying to, say, a market analyst role that requires three years of SQL experience, but you only have a total of, say, one year of experience as an intern, don't apply for this role. 
Otherwise, your application will easily get disqualified very early on in the process. Try to focus on jobs where you meet 90% of the requirements and you have a much better chance of getting on the phone with someone in the office. So keep your resume concise and to the point. And what I mean by that is focus on the key points of the work that you've actually done. Don't try to over-exaggerate or oversell your role. So for example, using the previous role as an example, if your main duty was to produce reports as a market analyst, for instance, you'd wanna focus on the type of reports that you were producing and the techniques that you use during that time as well as the different technologies. If only 10% of your time was spent liaising with a manager and influencing decisions, don't try and oversell that as one of the key functions of your role when really it was more a technical type role. And so focus primarily on what you actually did as it will come up on the interview and you will have to be able to speak on it. And next, focus on quality over quantity. So once you've nailed out your key technologies that you have skills with and you know the type of jobs that you're actually looking for, you really wanna focus on sending out six to 10 quality applications directly related to your field of work. So instead of sitting there and blasting out 300 applications to uh, you know any position which might have the correct buzzwords for your particular role, just try to focus on a small number, 10 or less, of really specific jobs focused on your individual skill set. Too often I see candidates who apply for five to six different roles in the same organization and they're just hoping they're going to hit up. It's going to work on for one of those roles specifically, but it doesn't always work out that way. And it might actually degrade the quality of your application if they see your name pop up in five different roles and some of which aren't relevant to your skill set at all. And next, I would say do everything in your power to make yourself recognizable to the employer. So the first thing you can do is search your near inventory. So look at the jobs that you're applying for, look at the companies and see if you know anyone at any of those companies. Like, do you have any friends that work there? Do you have any second degree connections? Do you have any former coworkers, classmates or family members? If one person that can vouch for you, this can make a huge difference it's going to be a huge difference in your application. Simply having someone who's able to pull your applicant out of a, say, two to 300 different people that might be applying to the same role, I mean, it can really get you ahead in the process. All right, and next slide, please. Okay, and the next key points I have, this would clearly go out, or this would more specifically go out to tech employees. So. Let's say, for instance, that you're an iOS developer. You know, you really want to clearly define the projects that you've worked on. What type of applications you've been developing? What stage of the project did you enter? How much time did you spend working on each project? And further, you want to clearly define the length of time in which you have used your different key technologies and skill sets. So, for instance, a lot of the times I'll see people with a with a skills matrix on their resume. And it basically has a laundry list of every technology that they've ever used in their working history. And that's fine, like you wanna see that you've used different technologies, but you really wanna focus in on the ones where you have the most experience, the ones that you've worked on primarily and used in the key projects throughout your career. And finally, be prepared to show your work. So have your GitHub available or a blog or a Dribbble account or a different or a portfolio or a slideshow that can showcase your work because this is something that this will be looked at at some point during the interview stage and once you get to the in-person stage you know you might actually have to be able to show your applications on a phone or a direct web application that you've worked on so all in all i would say just be prepared and focus on Focus primarily on roles where you know you fit 90 to 100% of the required skills. And again, be prepared to show your work and speak directly on your experience. So next, I want to pass the mic along to Angela, another recruiter here at Accelerate. And she's gonna talk about how to be successful in the remote interview process. Thank you so much, Rob, uh, for those great insights and also for the brief introduction. And for all those listening in live, it's really, really nice to have you here. And yeah, I'll jump straight into it. So first I'll introduce myself. So my name is Angela. 
and I'm working as a talent partner at Accelerate as well, where I've been supporting different tech startups within the, in Berlin, specifically for the last one year and probably nine months now. So I want to specifically focus on the interview can you be successful in a remote interview process? So I know right now with the situation, we're all working from home. So you're wondering, okay, how will I do my on-site interview? How will I do the last interview? So I want to walk you through some tips that could help you through this uh, time. So I would like to divide it into three parts. So you think about you as the interviewee and then the technology and then the interviewer. Uh, because your interviewer is also working from home and the only thing that's connecting you right now is either a phone or your laptop or computer. So I want to cover each and every step uh, of those different parts of the process. So obviously preparation is key. So just like you would prepare for any other interview, whether it's on site, you need to prepare for yourself, prepare for the remote interview as well. So dig up as much information as possible about the company, get to know who they are. If you know somebody who's worked there, do some research on the company. And right now, even with the current situation, I know some people ask some questions to Chido earlier on before the talk that, hey, how do I know what company to apply for? How do I know what company is safe to apply for? So do your research beforehand so that you can also ask the right questions in the interview process to get you the right information dress the part. So I know we've all heard of those jokes of people not wearing pants when they're working from home. So don't be that person. So dress the part. So do some research on the company, find out what their dress code is. You don't need to wear a suit necessarily and a tie, of course, depending on the role you're applying for, but wear something that makes you feel comfortable, that you'll feel the most confident in as well. So that's really, really important. And the next thing is your body language. So I know when you just have a computer in front of you and you don't see the other person on the other side physically, it's very easy to forget and maybe touch your hair or kind of look to the side. So it's very, very important to keep your eyes on the camera. I know it's most of the time you're tempted to look at the screen, which is okay, but it's good to look at the camera most of the time so the other person feels that they are really connecting with you. Sit up straight, try not to slouch as well because then it makes you look really unmotivated or lazy. And I feel every time I sit upright and look into the camera, it gives me more confidence as well. And then mind your surroundings. So I know that right now, as you're working from home, you probably have kids running around or you have roommates or you have, I don't know, people around you, family, friends. So it's very important to ask them to give you the privacy that you need and the quiet that you need to go through your interview successfully. And then a positive mindset. So right now, personally, speaking from my own experience, especially at the start of working from home, I had a little bit of anxiety, you know, with the current situation, feeling demotivated, like, why should I even apply? You know, companies are not hiring. The future looks so, you know, sad. But it's very, very important to keep your spirits up so have some coffee if it's in the morning have some tea have breakfast don't forget to eat so that you're in your best you know mode i personally like to listen to music as well before getting my day started because it gives me the energy and pumps me up so do whatever you can to put yourself in a positive place and don't get lost in covid19 so it's very easy to get tempted to like have the conversation that, hey, how is it going? You know, I know you're also working from home. How are you coping? It's, a, it's very okay to ask, of course, and be empathetic. But remember, this is an interview still, and you need to focus on your strengths. So with regards to technology, get familiar with the interviewing tools. So many companies are using tools such as Google Hangouts, Zoom, or even mobile phone. So that means check your lighting in advance, check your microphone. If you need headsets, make sure you have those on hand, test them out. Try calling a friend and see how your Skype works, for instance. Make sure you have a strong internet connection as well. So this is very important. And I would definitely advise you to test things out the day before or hours in advance. So you set yourself up for success. And with regards to the other person, so it's not just about you, remember? So it's also about the other person. So exercise empathy. So right now it's uh, a tough time for everybody. So the interviewer, of course, is not looking for a job. You know, they don't have 
anything to worry about probably in that department that you know of but maybe you know ask them about their family hey how is it going with your family hope you're okay keep it short and sweet but show some empathy as well and get all the necessary information so what does this mean uh ask about the start date, you know, potentially. With many companies that have gone remote now, it might be tricky knowing how you'll start, you know, when you'll start. So it's good to get this information. Will you need a visa, for instance? Uh, what do you need to know? Salary expectations. So make sure you also try to clarify this in the interview. Next interview steps as well. So it's good to know all these things so that you know how to, what to expect as well. And lastly is follow-up communication. So it's very, very important uh, to follow up. So after the interview, I personally like it when someone sends me an email saying, hey, thank you so much. It was nice speaking to you. So I think it's very, very important to follow up and you know, send them an email says, saying, hey, I learned so much about your product and your company. It would be really a pleasure to work for something amazing and looking forward to hearing from you. So it's not pushy at all, but just shows that you're interested in the role. Then just to finish off, so I want to also explain accepting an offer remotely. So everything has gone well, successfully, and now they give you an offer, right? What are you supposed to do? We're all working from home. How will you do onboarding? So I want to kind of dive into that as well. So asking, so ask is very, very crucial. I kind of use this as sort of like an abbreviation to lead us to the next points that I'm going to share. So accepting the offer, seeking information and gathering knowledge. So these are the things that you need through this period to get you started on the right foot. Um, to start off with accepting the offer. So it's very, very important to remember that it's not only the company that's interviewing you, but you're also interviewing the company. You want to know, is this the kind of company I want to work for? Is this the culture that I want to work for? So it's very good to ask all these questions beforehand. Uh, ask them when you when do they expect you to start you know what do they expect from you before you start is the salary in line if you need to relocate for instance especially right now when will you do that you know so make sure you have all that information beforehand then clarify your doubts as well so if there's anything that you're not sure about ask for a follow-up call i know there are many recruiters who will be happy to organize a follow-up call with you to clarify any doubts you might have and then follow up on your contract. So it might be very easy for some companies to forget, you know, to send your contract or to delay on this. So I would definitely recommend to follow up on the contract uh, if you haven't received it, you know, so that you can be able to get that security that you need. And then secondly, seeking information. So be proactive. It's very, very important to be proactive, especially right now when you can't go to the office and you're working from home. So make sure you know your main points of contact. So who do you need to contact? Is it the HR? Is it the person you're reporting to? So it's very, very important to know who in the organization is going to help you, help you through your onboarding process. Um, make sure you have your onboarding schedule. So that's also very important. Of course, most companies will provide this, but if they haven't, it's good to have that beforehand so that you prepare yourself in advance, knowing what topics you're going to cover, you know, what you need to do, what's expected of you, what Slack channels do you need to join, what meetings you need to join and things like that. So it's very, very important to have that beforehand. And then making sure you have all your tools set up, so I've heard of some companies that are also offering to carry PCs and monitors to the homes of their employees, so which is really nice. So if you need a PC to work with, make sure you ask for that. Uh, if you need to set up something, make sure you ask for that. And then lastly, it's also very important to attend the company-wide team events, even if we're all working remotely. So it's very, very easy to get demotivated and think, oh, why should I join this call? You know, there are so many people. Do I even need to be a part of this? I would definitely recommend that in your first uh, week, it's nice to attend at least most of the events that you need to attend so that you show yourself, everyone knows who you are, make an intro on Slack, for instance, you know, about yourself so that everyone gets, gets to know who you are as well. So the last point, um, please feel free to get a glass of water. I know it's a lot of information, but yeah, I hope you've been able to get some insights there. Uh, but just to finish up, I want to talk about knowledge gathering. So when you, you are a new employee and you're working remotely, it can be a, a little bit tough. 
So I would say it's important to go through the Slack channels uh, or company portals, for instance, of the company that you're working for, just to see what they've been doing for the past weeks, what's been going on, what events they've been having, how they like to communicate. And then secondly, I would advise you to get a buddy as well. I personally, if I'm, I start in a new company, I want to have a buddy. So this is not your manager, but someone who you can sort of, you know, talk to if you have any issues, you know, have a virtual coffee with as well now that we're working remotely. Also virtual coffees with other team members, just so that you get familiar with the company culture as well. And clarify your expectations. Uh, so in this case, it's very, very important to talk to your manager. So, you know, you'll still be in your probation period and you want to be successful. So talk to your manager honestly and say, hey, you know, um, I want to know how best I can make an impact in this company right now. What should I do? You know, what is expected of me in week one, week six, week, you know, seven, six months so that you know how to best set yourself up for success. And lastly is don't forget your workspace. So that's very important. I personally have just one small table that I'm working with here, but I try to make it as, you know, like pretty as possible to put things that motivate me, that lift up my spirits, make sure I have great lighting so that I can be able to attend all the meetings successfully. So also uh, set up your workspace so that when you have your first day, everything goes smoothly. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, right now I will hand over to Chido who will open up the Q&A and I'll be looking forward to answering some of your questions uh, and also clarifying anything that's not clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela, Rob, and Annie for all of those key insights. And I'm sure they're going to help you spice up your job search. I can't wait to hear how all of you have found that amazing job. Let me know. So now we've come to the Q&A session. So um, uh, we're just going to get into some of these key questions I can see here. We've got about seven key questions that have a lot of votes from you. I'm going to start off with uh, Delphina's question. Um, she's asking about cover letters. Are they still important when applying a job? Maybe Annie, you can, uh, you can answer this question. Yeah, thank you, Chido, and thank you, Delfina, for asking this. I see a lot of people are asking cover letter-related questions. So there are two scenarios. First, um, this particular employer says that in please always include a cover letter. In that case, always include it. Second case is that maybe they don't say. They say, uh, please apply here or something like that, but they don't specify whether they want a cover letter from you. So then in this case, I would take a sp step back and really think, okay, what is a cover letter at the end of the day? It's an additional piece of information that usually explains your key motivation and maybe your, your own strengths to an employer that might not be best conveyed through a CV, which mostly explains your work history. In that sense, um, I would decide on um, a couple of different factors. So depending on the type of role you're applying to, is it a senior role? Is it a junior role? Is it um, a, a role that's for software engineer? Or is it a role that's for marketer? Because if you're a software engineer, maybe in this cover letter, uh, you know, writing a long cover letter or, or three paragraphs um, doesn't matter as much as if you are a marketing manager or if you're somebody working in more of the creative or content content creation places where the cover letter could potentially serve as a piece of evidence to showcase your skills. And that can, that would be more relevant. But I also see some more creative formats these days, uh, potentially in uh, simply writing a, a email explaining your key motivations um, rather than including a cover letter or maybe um, talking to somebody at the company directly on LinkedIn um, or potentially some people also include videos. So personally speaking, if the company doesn't um, specify that you have to include a cover letter, I would say you can be as creative as you want and really find the best channel that explains who you are. So that would be my answer. Maybe Angie or Rob can answer this one. Or any start, um, and maybe um, Angela or Rob can. Yeah, can, I can jump um, in. 
Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, so I would say career change is applying for entry level positions. Um, so this is a bit tougher because I'm assuming based on the context that previously you probably, you probably have already had a several years of experience, but now you're changing into a different industry uh, and, and potentially um, kind of starting from scratch. So I would say here the advantages that you have would be um, your, your working experience and those things um, really teach you a lot more things than just kind of the essential skill sets. Um, so always think about how when you're applying to a job, there, there are usually two or three main components. So there would be the hard skills that you would need for that job. So these could be, you know, as a software engineer, your programming skills in a specific language. Or um, as a marketer, it could be um, your skills as using different tools um, for marketing. So there's the hard skills part and there's the soft skills part. So the soft skills could be how you communicate yourself, how you how you project manage um, or how you work with a team, um, how you present yourself in front of people. So um, always think from these different aspects and really evaluate yourself and know um, if you're stronger in one particular aspect or stronger in a particular in another aspect. And if you feel like you're lacking in that aspect, make sure to to take action to kind of um, improve yourself in that regard. Um, so maybe the other speakers could could add on. Yeah, sure. I can jump in uh, after Annie. Actually, this is something that we did a talking talent on as well some time back. So we're focusing on basically people who wanted to change from non-tech roles to tech roles. And one of the things that I think was really important is to also join. There are so many, I think, uh, meetups for people, you know, kind of going into roles. For instance, I know some meetups for designers, junior UX designers, for instance, or even get some, there's some free or career coach um, events. I know there's a company called My Career Path as well that works with helping people transitioning into their careers. And so this, there are so many companies there that are willing to help people to transition and also connect them actually to jobs as well. So it's very, very important to join these groups, join this organization, go for meetups as well. I think networking is one really, really, really strong element in actually, you know, getting jobs, whether it's, I don't know, different events, you know, always keep it at the back of your mind that maybe I might meet somebody who will see my experience, you know, behind the CV, behind the cover letter. So definitely network as much as possible. Also going, for instance, for people in the tech field, there are some organizations like Ruby on Rails, you know, Girls Who Code, uh, meetups for specific languages or specific things. So try to put yourself to attend these things. If you're not in Europe and you're, let's say, back, let's say, in Asia or Africa or the US, where maybe there might not be some like similar meetups, try Facebook. I know there are so many Facebook groups as well for young entrepreneurs or young uh, adults who are trying to get into uh, new jobs, or, yeah, and then maybe try networking in those ways as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. For yeah, thanks, Chido. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. This seems to be uh, quite a popular one. How should you handle rejection? So I think this can be for... Um, any of you who feel you can answer this question? The first thing I would say is, I mean, you're going to be getting formally rejected by the company. Get as much information as you can as to why you were rejected. Do you literally like, you know, ask as many questions, even if that takes multiple emails, like they might just kind of give you a um, generalized response at first. And then you're going to have to say, okay, but like what specifically was I missing in my profile? Or if you weren't missing in my profile, ask them what specifically were you missing in the interview? Because it can sometimes be, you can have all of the necessary skills for the job, but maybe your interview didn't go that well. Maybe you weren't as confident as they would have liked in the uh, assessment stage. Or, you know, you need to find out exactly what it was that uh, didn't get you past the preliminary round. Anyone else had that? <laughs> Yeah, I'd also like to add on to that. I think yeah, what Rob said is very important, getting the right feedback. I think also 
try if let's say you interviewed for let's say one specific job and then you notice that they have another job that also matches your experience maybe try following up with hey so i know that i didn't get this job is it possible that i could be considered for the other job so obviously make sure you do have the relevant experience of course not that you don't have the experience for that but i think that's also a good way to show that you're really interested in the company and who knows maybe they'll hire you for that other role uh, and not the one you got, and then slowly you can also learn about the other role. So I hope that makes sense, but I think definitely doing some research on what other roles they have open and seeing if there's anything else that could match your experience. Thank you, Angie and Rob, for that. Um, next question is um, from Shaley. Okay. In the German market, is it mandatory or good to send a cover letter? Oh, wait, no, we've had something like that, right? Um, okay, from Helen, I've applied to roles at large companies and would like to follow up on, on my application status. However, I do not have any recruiter or hiring manager to contact. How should I contact them? Should I okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd say uh, the advice for that is maybe try doing some research on LinkedIn, for instance. So trying to find out, okay, who works in that company, who is in the recruitment department, for instance, or who is maybe the hiring manager for that role. So what does that mean? So let's say you applied for a junior marketing position, for instance try to, at, let's say, let me give an example, Google. Of course, it's such a large organization. I don't even know how many recruiters or people are there, but find maybe one or two recruiters that you can reach out to on LinkedIn as well and say, hey, I said in my application, I hope I'm not being too pushy, but I just wanted to know uh, what the status is. There are chances that maybe they won't respond, but there are also some good chances that they'll get back to you and sort of follow up with you on that. So I would say, maybe trying LinkedIn to see what kinds of people could be points of contact for you. Thank you, Angie, for that. Um, next question is from, um, okay. okay. Let me just double check here. Do you have Slack group suggestions in Berlin? Uh, I think this is for people looking for jobs here in Berlin. I can suggest a few. So um, I would say one main one uh, that I use a lot is Startup, Ber Startup Berlin. So if you just Google Startup Berlin, you can find it. But a uh, majority of the Slack groups, especially based in Berlin, are usually categorized by community. Um, so you can find, for example, people um, that are um, software engineers using a specific language, um, or you can find groups that are dedicated to women, or you can find groups that are specifically for sales and business developers. What I would usually do is that I would just search in Google Slack group, be able to find a lot of good results and make sure you um, those um, that are closest to your needs. All right, thank you for that. Um, I have a question from Michelle. If you receive a job offer, but the salary isn't as discussed or expected, any tips on how to deal with this? Maybe Rob or Angie can answer. I guess it depends on what stage you're, um, you're finding out the sal with the salaries and what you expected? I mean, is this in the recruitment stage or are we talking down at the end of the line? Do you have any insight on that, Cheeto? I don't. Um, maybe. Oh, yeah, we can just take a look at both examples then. Yeah. So, I mean, the recruiter might give you a salary range and you might figure that, okay, this isn't quite what I want it to be at. Um, I would honestly based on your experience see what's reasonable and see if they'd be willing to put you in at a higher rate which isn't always out of the question especially if you're bringing a lot of experience to the table um, that being said if you are 
if you are at the end of the stage and you're dealing with a hiring manager who you think is giving you a lower salary or offering you a lower salary than what you were expecting, the best thing I can do, it, say, is try to provide with them some competing offers or just some market data on what you've been getting elsewhere in terms of salary offers or what your coworkers have been getting who might have a similar skill set. It really is specific to each company though, so it's hard to specifically answer that question. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay. So we have a question from Mohammed. I think this is a master's student, so it's a, it's a question more for students uh, who are watching this. And he's looking for an opportunity to improve his skills. He says he's been looking for a job for four months, but unfortunately, all positions he found um, he doesn't have enough experience for. So what should he do to tackle this requirement? Should he ignore or apply for the job? I've recently been helping a few friends um, with their job search um, and I would say my personal suggestion is in this case you need to really take a closer look at the, the positions you're applying for um, and the companies that you're applying to. So if you're applying for let's say mid-level senior position that usually requires three to five years of experience then I would say this is a bit hard. Um, it would be, for example, potentially a, a junior or um, entry level or entry to mid level position that maybe require one or two years of experience um, that potentially you can have more room to negotiate. So how I would go about this is um, so, for example, right now, like in my um, in my in my current roles that I'm recruiting for, I'm looking for a lot of mid level to senior experienced people, but I do get a lot of master's students who are about to graduate looking for a job applying to me. In this case, because um, the company itself is a small startup, small st startups tend to need people who are experts already in their fields, who have done it before, so that they can do it in a smaller size with less maybe super less people um, helping them or guiding them. So in this case, there's less room um, for uh, kind of changing the job requirement on the years of experience. So what I would do is really take a closer look at the job and the company you're applying to. If let's say um, it's a junior entry level position, then most likely maybe um, your CV doesn't look particularly like a typical fit that they would expect. Um, make sure to potentially contact the recruiter directly or hiring manager um, and have a more personalized approach and say, hey, like understand that maybe um, there are some things on my CV that don't really fit this requirement, um, but make sure you don't give up and you say that um, you have still these other experiences in your studies or these other hard skills that could potentially make up for it and whether they're uh, willing to potentially give you an opportunity for a call. Great, thank you so much, Annie. Our next question is from Khaled. And he's asking about, um, is there any chance for applicants who had a plan to move to Germany in order to look for jobs, but their plans got disturbed because of the Corona situation? How do we approach this and increase um, our chances? Maybe Angela or, or Rob can also put in. Yeah, just to give my point of view. So obviously there's only so much you can do, especially if there are legal barriers to entry in the country at the moment. So that's something that cannot be really controlled by the companies themselves. But I would say if you're like, just do some research on companies that are still hiring. Like I think Annie discussed in her first slides before. So find out what companies are still hiring and find out what companies are still willing to relocate people. Of course, it might happen that you'll still start working remotely. So that's very important for you to know is that you won't be able to come over like right away, but maybe you can start remotely. So I know many companies, for instance, Inkit, which have been supporting with recruitment, who have had people starting already to work um, remotely and they just onboarded remotely, but then they'll relocate later on when the situation gets better. Another piece of advice would be to maybe also try applying to remote companies. So there are companies in Germany that are remote, which means that they don't have, maybe they have an office, but not everyone is working there or they don't have a physical office and are working remotely. So in this case, if you're working for this company, you can give yourself a higher chance to maybe later relocate to Germany because maybe they start working in an office or maybe they have an event or things like that, or 
they are willing to have you relocate later on. So trying remote companies, finding out what companies are still hiring, and also finding out if you're already in the interview process, find out what the starting procedure would be like. So do you have to onboard remotely? Will you have to relocate? Uh, but yeah, that's as much as I can say, uh, because with the, we can't really know or say when, you know, the borders will be open for people to travel, but at least you can try your shot at applying with remote companies or companies that are still hiring and are willing to onboard people remotely. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, our next question is from, um, sorry, Shamsina, I hope I said that right. So she's asking, um, even most of the entry level jobs usually require experience. Any tips on dealing with this? Rob? Previous question also kind of asked in a similar direction, right? So um, it's, it really has to depend on what you're applying to. Maybe Rob has a few more tips in there. Yeah, so I've definitely seen this happen a few times recently. And um, I agree, of course, you're, they're always gonna want some experience, even for like a really entry level job. And the people that seem to be getting these roles have you know, made an effort to do internships throughout their time and their master's studies, or they've worked as a teaching assistant, just anything so they can, by the time they finish their degree, they actually have marketable experience as opposed to just as an education. Of course, you still need the education, but like putting those skills to use is the most important thing, even if it's not in a full time role in a company, you know, anything you can do from working with the teaching assistant, working in a lab, even during your studies or doing some sort of internship. Those would be the best pieces of advice I could give. And if you're having still having trouble after graduating, you can use that same advice. You know, you can always go back to your school and see if you can work as an assistant. Just find an internship to do in that time. Yeah. Add on top of that, if you're not a student anymore, um, maybe some of the option could be that um, do a couple of freelance projects, create some of your own projects and really make sure you build up a portfolio of some kind um, or make sure that you already have something that you can showcase by the time you apply. Thank you so much, Annie and Rob. Um, I have another question here from Varun, and he's asking what or how do you tell or ask a recruiter who is unsure of how they themselves will go ahead with the, with the recruitment process in these times? So any one of you could answer this one. Maybe Annie or Angie. Chida, sorry, could you repeat that question? Um, and he's asking, what or how do you tell if a recruiter is unsure of how they themselves will go ahead with the recruitment process, um, especially in these times? Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question, actually. And I think in one of the tips I gave is also asking the right questions. So I think it's important to ask them that, OK, if, should, if I roll, what does my role look like in the first one week? What am I going to be doing? Who am I going to be reporting to? What do I need to know in, for the first three months? You know, so in this way, you kind of get to gauge their sense. If they say something like, yeah, uh, the moment we're not so sure who you're reporting to, or we don't know yet, then there, that's something to worry about. If the recruiter doesn't know, you know, who you're reporting to, what team you're going to be in, uh, when you're starting. So it's very good to clarify those things. I think also asking them when would they expect you to start. So usually if they really need someone, if the job is really hot on the market and they're really looking for someone, they'll tell you that, yeah, we're looking for someone as soon as possible. You know, if you can start tomorrow, that would be great. Of course, they also respect, you know, notice periods, but really asking them the questions of when do you need me to start? What things would I be working on? It's, I think it's also important to ask what challenges your role is going to be solving at this time. So ask them like, so what are the challenges you have right now with regards to this role? Why do you have this position open? So usually uh, if they really want someone to work in this role, they'll be able to clarify all those things um, in the interview process. So basically ask the right questions uh, and gauge from the answer. Hope that answers the question, I hope. 
I would also um, add on top of what Angie said. So she gave a lot of really great advice, but on top of that, make sure you remember potentially these recruiters that are interviewing you, their jobs might be on the line as well. So they are also people that are potentially facing problems and maybe they are also uncertain of whether their position would still continue in the future. So make sure you kind of go about it with a more personal approach and be more empathetic and mention things in in, in these tones and directions that are more like, oh, how can I help you and how can I support you um, to make a more informed decision? Is there anything I can do from my side, whether to provide additional materials about myself or, or is there anything else that I can help you? So I think this would be something that a lot of people would really appreciate. All right, thank you. I have another question here from um, Julian. He's asking, or she, uh, can you give us some tips on uh, on how to handle telephone interviews. So I think Rob could answer this question or Annie. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just treat it like a regular interview. Be prepared in the exact same way that you would for an in-person interview. I mean, you're gonna be speaking directly about your previous work experience, how that relates to the job requirement, how your education relates to the job requirement. You know, just being professional as possible, concise with your answers and informative. And yeah, of course, any other basic tips like showing on, even if, you know, you're not, uh, you know, doing the interview in person or if it's not a webcam, you know, still prepare for that interview, still get ready for it, still dress up, you know, act as if someone will be watching you during that time. Just, uh, yeah, I'd use all the same advice that you would take for a regular interview. Let me just look for these three more and then, yeah, I think we are done for today. Um, let's see. Okay. We have this question. What is the best way to find the typical salaries for Berlin startup positions? Any tips on resources or websites with market data? Um, maybe Annie or Rob or Angie, all of you. That is a great question. Um, I guess you could start by looking at Glassdoor and look at the companies that you're applying to and the salary ranges for the positions that are there. I know there are some other resources um, strictly for Germany in order to look this up. I don't have those on hand right now, so I can't uh, provide a link. Maybe we can provide that uh, afterwards if possible. But yeah, I know there are resources available online, but aside from that, just directly networking with people, seeing if you can find out um, through talking with others and looking on Glassdoor. It's the best piece of advice I can give. Um, Annie, do you have any chime in? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Annie. Um, AngelList is another good uh, place, especially if you're looking for startup jobs. Okay. Uh, I think I can't see the questions anymore. Uh, okay. Someone is asking what to write uh, to a recruiter. I know we had a question that was kind of similar to this, but what exactly can they write to a recruiter uh, over LinkedIn? But if this was touched on, we can move on to another question. Um, I could quickly answer that, maybe. so. If you're writing in terms of following up on your app, it would be good to just make it quick, short and, you know, sweet. Because imagine recruiters are also receiving lots and lots of um, LinkedIn messages. So I'll probably say that, hey, um, I know this is, you know, unconventional and I know you have a lot on your plate. I sent in my application last week and I just wanted to know if uh, you've received it or had a chance to review it. I also understand if you need some more time uh, to do that. So really being empathetic, but at the same time, going straight to the point. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to add on to that. Thank you, Angie. That was really great tips. Um, I would also add that um, I know that Shivani asked this question and she actually already sent me a LinkedIn request, although with no message, which is usually 
not the best approach, um, but usually if I were approaching a recruiter or if I, I, were, I were to add anybody on LinkedIn, usually always make sure you include a message whether you're in their interview process or not. So um, remind yourself again that you're talking to a person, even though through the screen. Um, so just be um, really personal about it and say, um, let's say uh, I'm writing to Angela. So I could say, hey, Angela, I noticed that you're working currently as a recruiter um, and I'm really interested interested in what your company is doing, I would love to stay connected and uh, be part of your network. Or you can say, um, hey, Rob, um, I hope this message finds you well and that you're doing good in this these crazy times. Um, I myself am a graphic designer. I saw that you have a few relevant roles open and I would love to ask for more information. So just be clear about the purpose, even though you want to just maybe generally connect with them being their network, mention that as well. So it's becoming more and more common that people add each other on LinkedIn to, to be in their network. So don't be afraid. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have, I think, time for one more, one or two more questions. We have one from Kay, and he's asking about, um, he has big gaps in his CV that he can't cover. He just finished a one-year online marketing course and thought about making an SEO audit of the company's websites to show his skills. How should he approach companies and show that he can still provide value and how can they consider him as an intern? Maybe uh, Annie, Rob? Yeah, so um, some first thoughts, um, it's actually becoming increasingly common that people have time in their CV, maybe a time period that they're, they're not actively employed. Um, so this is fine. A lot of people just say that they're on a sabbatical or, um, or maybe they're a mother um, and they have to take care of their families. So this is um, becoming more and more, and more common. Um, you finished a one-year online marketing course. This is really cool, actually, and you're taking your time to build up on your professional skills. So um, that's already really good. You thought about making an SEO audit of the company website. This is a really, really good idea. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're using this way to approach it. Um, so when you approach companies, how do you show that you can provide value? Um, this is a very direct value that you can already provide to them. Um, so in this case, maybe contacting their recruiter, their HR person, or potentially anybody in the marketing department that has something to do with SEO um, and uh, potentially reach out to them on LinkedIn and, and mention or even write them an email. Um, but also keep in mind that if they're an established company with a website, potentially they might have already done some kind of SEO audit. Um, so you're not coming off as hey, I noticed you haven't done anything yet and I want to, to do this for you, but um, really kind of be a bit more conscientious. Uh, but don't be afraid to shoot an email or write a LinkedIn message or write a Zing message, um, whichever platform you can find them. All right. Thank you so much, Annie, for that answer. I like the final answer. We have one minute left. So um, someone is asking if they have any specific questions pertaining to their career or um, anything to do with um, getting extra help and tips from us. Um, they're asking if we can, if he can reach out to any of us. And yes, definitely you can. After this webinar, feel free to reach out to any of us via our LinkedIn. You can also check out, as I said before, our talent community um, page on our website where you can sign up and share with us details of what you're looking for. Feel free, I'm always on LinkedIn anyway, so you can also reach out to any of us, Angie, Annie, Rob, Thank you all so much for making the time to join us. Unfortunately, I think we have just a few seconds left now. So yeah, thank you for joining us. I hope this was insightful and I hope you get to spice up that job search. I can't wait to hear about all of you getting jobs, um, especially during this time. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Annie, Rob, Angela, and I hope you all have an, a lovely evening and um, hope to see you soon. We have upcoming webinars coming, so just keep Keep on track on our LinkedIn, on our website. We have Instagram as well. So check us out. Bye. Thank you, Cheeto. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Cheeto. And thanks for everyone Bye. coming out. Good luck to your job search. We're here for you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And stay connected with us as well on LinkedIn. And you can find our names on the event page as well. So sure. definitely send us a message. Yeah. Just say hey. <laughs>